All right. So on our handouts, we, as you well know, have been talking about the French Revolution, which you think has a lot in common with the American Revolution, and it does, right? We said most importantly, all of us should know that society was made up of how many branches in French society? Three. There was the first estate out of the 25 million people, 28 million people rather lived in France. The first estate was the clergy, there were the religious people. We said that they made up about half a percent of all the people who lived in France, but they owned 10% of the land. And often what was the deal with them and taxes? They were tax free, right? So that's a good life. We talked about the second state, the, the nobility, people born rich. They were about 1% of the population population owned about 30% of the land. And then we talked about the third estate, which is everyone else. Well, the thing about this third estate includes two different or a wide variety of people. It includes peasants, which is like 80% of the population. And on the opposite end of poor peasants, what kind of people? Bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie. These are middle class. Middle class people, not born rich, work their wealth, so they're not second estate at all. We also said at the time that unemployment and hunger were common. Some people actually turned to prostitution to solve this. We said in Paris alone, there was 25,000 prostitutes. We saw a scene from the movie Les Mis, which even though it's set after the French Revolution, it still kind of showed you how people in desperation turned to those types of practices. We said that people abandoned kids, 40,000 child abandonments a year. And then we also talked about King Louis the 16th. Now, Louis the Sixteenth lives in Versailles, his fancy palace. But where did he also blow the budget on? The American Revolution. He financed the American Revolution, and he decides that look, we gotta raise some taxes to pay all these bills, not only to keep Versailles and the party going, but also to um, uh, also to pay off all the debt from the American Revolution. So he calls the a state general to meet, that's like their Congress or their parliament. Uh, this is the first time they met since 1614. And the problem with the estates general is instead of it voting by population, because if it voted by population, who would get most of the power? The third estate, right? But actually how they vote to pass laws in the estates general is every estate gets one vote. So as we mentioned, the clergy is asked, hey, first estate, how would you like to raise taxes on the third estate? And the clergy says, hey, sign me up. Hey, second estate, do you want to raise taxes on the third estate? Yes, I do. Hey, third estate, do you want to raise taxes on you? And they say, no, that's like terrible. Well, sorry, you got outvoted two to one. That's not really fair, and that's not, rep a tax that's not taxation with representation. So we said the National Assembly, that we said the third estate broke off on their own, and they promised to meet in a tennis court, and they said they wouldn't stop meeting until what was passed. A constitution. Things are going great, but there's a prison uh, called the Bastille. And you might remember there was a prison that en ends up being mobbed by 70,000 people. And the reason they mobbed this prison is there was rumors that what was going on inside. There's political prisoners. The rumor, the word was that people were being arrested for just basically asking for freedom, arrested for asking for democracy, arrested for, for just really trying to fight for basic rights. And so a crowd of tens of thousands shows up, they, they bust in and 98 of them die, but ultimately they're successful because 90, uh, because this, this crowd, they actually even behead the commander of the prison, march him through the street, but what do they find inside the prison when they open up the jail? Yeah, there's like seven prisoners. Some of them were insane. There was a guy who thought he was Jesus. Another guy thought he was the king of England. So it turns out the reason for like storming turns out not to have been true. And that sucks. But regardless, it's still the symbolic start of the French Revolution to this day. July 14th is a holiday. It's called Bastille Day. 
all throughout France, the revolution starts, peasants rise up all throughout France. Make sure you tell me about the Declaration of the Rights of Man. I've already mentioned this to you. And then we see if the Bastille is a symbol of oppression, there's another building which is a symbol of extravagance. What building would that be? Versailles. We saw various clips from a movie called Marie Antoinette yesterday, Versailles, where they lived in luxury, and angry women stormed Versailles, particularly angry at a woman named Marie Antoinette, who, though rumors said, let them eat cake when she heard people were starving. We know that that was not true, but she was still a symbol of extravagance. Her and her husband were forced back to Paris to pass a constitution. We also mentioned last time that the neighbors got involved. Austria and Prussia invade Russia, uh, France, and they do it because they feel if the French people rise up and get rid of their kings, what will happen if our people do the same? This invasion doesn't work out. Now, the story now continues where it says reign of terror. You might recall that there was rumors that there was a movement to get rid of the revolution. In fact, the rumor was that people in prison were secret spies and they were going to actually rise up and break out of jail to stop the revolution. And to stop this so-called plot, half of all the prisoners were killed. This is just like conspiracy theory stuff because like none of those guys were actually, you know, none of those people were spies. And Thousands of people were killed for no reason. Louis XVI realizes things are going crazy, so what does Louis XVI decide to do? Sure. Tries to run away, tries to leave, tries to cross the border. He puts like a costume on so no one will recognize him. The problem is the border guard looks at a dollar bill that has his picture and says, I think you're the king. And he was right. What happened to Louis for the crime of bailing on France? Yeah, he was guillotined. This is the guillotine. It's a device, and this was made by a physician, a medical doctor, Dr. Guillotine, because they thought this was like more humane way of killing a person. He and his wife are guillotined. They're beheaded. And now a republic's declared. Well, now I need someone in charge. And the guy who's going to be in charge is going to lead this group of people called the Committee for Public Safety. And that title, it sounds good. I mean... They want what for the public? Safety, right? Like, how could that be bad? And the guy in charge is this guy, Robespierre. And the problem with Robespierre is that he believes that there's people in this room right now who say they're for the revolution, but they're not really for the revolution. In fact, he decides what we need to do is we need to arrest people that are really troublemakers, even if they say they're for the revolution, I think they're just not really being legit. We need people to be afraid to be against the revolution, because the revolution's good. We're getting rid of evil, getting rid of oppression. He once said, or he said that he would arrest people that were not revolutionary enough. He once said terror is nothing else than justice. And how many people did Robespierre have executed? Did we talk about this? How much? 40,000 were executed. How many thrown in jail? 300,000. We are getting rid of people who are not on board. Now, some of these people were just innocent people. Uh, some of these people were like, no, I really am for the revolution. But they were perceived not to be. They were perceived to be troublemakers, and so they were thrown in jail. Well, we got rid of the king. We got rid of crowds that are not in our favor. But there's another thing we need to really now think about getting rid of. What else has been used for thousands of years to control people other than kings? Uh, religion. religion, right? So we should like really think about getting rid of religion. And so on the next hand line, it says the de-Christianization of France. We see it says the rejection of kings and Christ. There's a good reason to get rid of Christ because I don't know if you've ever read the Bible. But the Bible says that there's a nickname for Jesus. He's sometimes called the King of Kings. And if we know anything about kings, kings are bad. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible 
that says, at the end of the world, every knee will bow to Jesus and every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord. And in the Bible, spoiler alert, in the last book, what happens to people who say no to King Jesus? They go to hell. For how long? Yeah, why would we want to allow a book that says you have to bow to a king, and if you don't, you go to hell? That sounds like a problematic book. In fact, I don't know if we should really allow Christianity the role it's had, because it sounds just like another way to control people like you and me. It says on the handout, churches were closed. Churches were closed. We don't want oppression anymore. So this is actually a good thing that we're closing churches. Now, I don't want to like waste a fancy church building, though. In fact, what's like the most famous church in Paris? Maybe the only church you know by name. It burned a few years ago. There's a church called Notre Dame, or Notre Dame. There's like a movie, cartoon, and a book called The Hunchback of Notre Dame, right? Or oh. no Notre Dame. So it's a real church, super famous. Well, I wanted to close churches, but I don't want to like waste that space. So I wonder if there's something we could do. Um, because it's cool that we meet, but I don't want to meet about a fairy tale dead Jewish god who dies and rises from the dead. Can we replace him with something better? I got an idea. Now, what's the philosophy that's supposed to drive the French Revolution and the American Revolution? The Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment is all about reason. In fact, sometimes this period is called the Age of Reason. So I'll tell you what we'll do. Instead of Sundays where we worship Jesus, how about we worship science instead? And so on this painting on the screen, what we have is a statue of the goddess of reason. And they're like, instead of bowing down to a dead Jewish man, let's bow down to science and say, science, you're the only thing we can trust in this crazy world. There was a name for this. This was actually called the cult of reason. And we'll write down that the goddess of reason was worshipped in Notre Dame, the most famous church in France, replaced Jesus with a statue representing the goddess of reason, worshiped in Notre Dame. So that's cool and all, but there's other things we might want to think about changing because it's problematic. Would you guys think it would be a good idea to name a highway or a street or a freeway over someone who's a bad person? Like, would we ever have Adolf Hitler Drive, Stalin Parkway, KKK Tollway? Because they are, they're problematic, right? We instead have streets named after heroes like MLK. Well, there's a problem in Paris because it turns out a lot of our streets are named after some pretty bad or challenging people. In fact, some of our streets are called like St. John Parkway, Charles Avenue, and if they're saints, then they're part of this power structure of the Catholic Church, and, and we just like actually close down those churches. So can we really allow streets to be honored by names that perpetuate structures of oppression? No. We'll write down on the handout, street names, over a thousand were changed. Over a thousand were changed. Over a thousand were changed. Two more things on this. We put a comma or a colon. There's something else we decide to change. In fact, not only are street names problematic, but think about some of our names, like common names Maria, Mary, Jacob, um, James, Jimmy, uh, Joshua, Elizabeth. They're all Bible names. Like, would you name your young son Osama bin Laden? No. No. Would you name your young son Adolf or Baby Stalin? No. I, I mean, maybe it should be. You know what else we should think about, like, making problematic? Naming our babies 
after characters that perpetuate systems and structures of inequality. So you know how there's like, you can Google like top names of 2021. Well, they start changing their baby names. And so the second thing I want you to write down on street names is they change baby names. And I'm going to read you, you don't have to write these down, but these are some of the most popular baby names. They start naming their baby the name Republic. They start naming their baby the name Civilization. They start naming the baby Equality. They start naming the baby Democracy. These are names we can all agree are classic names. These are all names we can agree point us to something better instead of this book about this God who wants to control your life. Instead, Baby Republic. I mean, that's like cute. Or Baby Constitution. You know, classic names that will always be popular from here on out. I mean, as long as you believe in freedom, you believe in freedom, right? So, like, you shouldn't be, like, against this change. There's a third thing that I want you to write down on this line. I want you to write down that they banned some games. There was games that they banned. What is that game called where you have a board that's black and white or black and another color and there's pieces that go on them? Chess, chess right? What's the most important part of the game of chess? What are some of the most important pieces? King, queen, knights, and bishop. And what are the pieces that you don't care if they die? You're telling me that there's a game that our children play where they are taught the most important pieces are kings, queens, and Catholic bishops? And you're telling me there's a game that our children play as young ones where they're taught that peasants are to be sacrificed? I don't know if that's okay. I don't know if our children should be playing this. Chess was banned. Why would you make oppression a game, Annabelle? There's another game that's problematic. Another game where queens and kings are the most coveted things in this game. In fact, they're so powerful they can, like, trump other hands. What are their... Oh, cards. Cards. Are those common? Is, is it hard to get a deck of cards? No. We have another game that's problematic where the heroes... Are, do we really want our children to grow up playing these kind of games where the rich and the powerful are the most important and I'm literally just a number that could be expended? I mean, we need to really think about banning cards as well. There's one more thing that they change and I want you to write down. We have street names were changed, baby names were changed, games were changed, but there's also something else. You know, while we're in the neighborhood of making the world better, because it's better that there's no more king, better there's no more Christ, better street names are changed, it's better that baby names are changed, it's better that uh, games are going to be banned. There's something else I think we need to really change. Question. Uh, what was yesterday's day, the name of the day yesterday? Thursday. What's Thursday named after? I mean, that's like a, every week we have Thursday. Turns out Thursday is named after God Thor, which is a god. Saturday is named after another god. What god is Saturday named after? Saturn. Uh, turns out the month of July is named after someone. July is named after Julius Caesar, a Roman emperor who pushed inequality. August is named after Augustine, another emperor it turns out like a lot of our months and days are named after either gods that think they're not equal to you but better or men who are not equal why would we support a system like this like why are we teaching our kids to learn the days of months and and days of the week that further systems of oppression i think we might want to i think we might want to fix this I'm going to give you a handout, and it's going to show you a brand new idea that they have to make the calendar better. 
Why are you laughing? You believe in celebrating oppression on a calendar? So, on the hand out in front of you, there is something way better than what we've had. They have what's called the Republican calendar. And instead of like old fashioned, we're naming stuff after gods or dictators, which is an equal inequality. Let's actually rename our months based on something we can all agree is good, science. Like, have you noticed that, like, during this time of year, you know, I don't know if you've heard, there's an expression like, March comes in like a lion and out like a lamb, or, like, there's like windy or whatever. Or, you know, like, it gets cold in certain months and hot in others. How about instead of, like, naming it after, like, dictators and gods, we name our months after scientific descriptions. According to this calendar, what month are we in now? What month are we in now? Yeah, we're in wind month. And I'm super excited because next month is what month? Budding month because flowers bud. There's flower month, meadow month, harvest month, heat month. Oh, I hate heat month. Man, heat month is like so, so hot, you know? There's fruit month, there's vintage month, fog month, frost month, snow month. They change the calendar. Because the old calendar is based on systems of oppression. There's something else, though, I think we might want to think about changing. We got rid of kings. We got rid of Christ. We got rid of street names. We got rid of chess. We got rid of the calendar. There's something else, though, I think we might need to really get rid of because it perpetuates the system of oppression. I, mean, I have a clock, but it's different. What's different about this clock? It goes up to 10. It goes up to 10. And they decide there's the old calendar. The old clock is messed up and stupid, so we're going to make it better. On our handout, let's label our old backwards clock and how it's stupid. For example, where it says one week, for us today, how many days in a week? Seven. seven. So write down seven. Have you ever thought that's kind of weird? Why seven? Like, that's not even like an even number. Like seven? Like, why would seven be the completion? That's just odd. Speaking of odd, for a day, how many hours in a day? 24? Where do we get that number from? Like, that's not, it's not even like a factor of seven. It's not even like 25. Like, I could see 25 hours in a day because, you know, it's like equal or whatever, you know, like four quarters. 25 hours, that's weird. In an hour, how many minutes in an hour? 60? A full hour is 60 minutes? Who came up with that? Why is 60 a full out? Like, that's not, that, 24 doesn't go into six. Like, these aren't even, like, who made up this, this clock? And how many seconds are in a minute? 60. So the French Revolution says, this doesn't make any sense. We need to actually make a new system based on science. So follow me now. The new calendar and the new clock, we're going to scratch everything and start fresh. And I want a system that makes sense. So if we have to make a week, literally seven seems like a number you just made up. What would be a good even number for how many days there should be in a week? Eight? That doesn't seem like, do you want an 80 for your class grade? What do I say? I'm going to give you a complete grade. Ten you, days. Now you're talking. Write down, a revolutionary calendar had 10 days. Now, let's talk about the day, because I'm really uncomfortable with this random 24-hour day. 
I want to make it even and nice and equal. How many hours should we put? No, that's just 20. That's weird. It'd be like if I gave you like a 200 for like a daily grade. Like a 10. A day was 10 hours. But now we need to figure out how many minutes. 60 is weird. Why would you get a 60 for a complete grade? I, have you done this before? Have you destroyed the rudiments of oppression before? Because it's coming naturally to you. 100 minutes in an hour. And finally, how many seconds should we put in every minute? 100. Do you see how much better this is? The old system is like random with like seven days here, 24 hours there, 60 seconds. I have made it based on science. This is way better than anything. This is way better than anything that we had before. So on our handout, we said that they renamed um, street names, baby names, we said that they banned games, and now they also have a new calendar and a clock. I mean, we have a lot of progress. That was the new clock. You can see it only has 10, and they thought this is better. This guy, Robespierre, is the guy making these changes. This guy, Robespierre, is the one who's been arresting people. And this guy, Robespierre, actually, things don't go so hot for him at the end. It says on the handout, Robespierre's fate, he was arrested for not being revolutionary enough. The same guy who arrested 300,000 and the same guy who killed 40,000, he himself was arrested and he himself was executed. Robespierre, the leader of this time we call the Reign of Terror, he's dead. And so we enter a new phase. The Committee for Public Safety, were they keeping the public safe? No, I mean, they killed thousands of people. Well, you know, we all make mistakes, right? That's why there's erasers on pencils. So let's not throw out the revolution yet. There's a new group of guys in charge, and they've got a cool name. They're called the directory. We'll write down five men rule. Now these five guys have your best interests in mind. And let me ask you a question. If you had like a younger sibling, like a three-year-old or a cousin, you know how like little kids like do bad stuff all the time and you're like, hey, you can't do that. And when they get angry, they act like drunk people. They cry or throw themselves on the ground or pee, pee their pants, you know? They're like little drunk people. Um, you can't let a little kid do whatever they want. If I asked my daughter, my three-year-old daughter, if I said, would you want pizza for dinner or candy? You choose. What is she going to choose? Candy, right? And actually, if I let her get what she chose, would I be a good father? If I let... If I gave her what she chose every time, which, would I be a good father? Oh. No, my job is to direct her. So there's these five guys in charge of France, the directory. And we're not there for no reason. Like, we're pretty smart guys. And I like voting as much as you guys like voting. But what if the people of France vote the wrong way? What if they want something that I know isn't good for them? Let's say we have an election, and the election gives them a choice, and what if they vote the wrong way? Should we allow that election to be counted? Should we allow that election to stand? What do you think? I don't think so. It says on the handout, in 1797, they suspended the results of the election. There was an election in 1797, and the directory thought, I think you guys have chosen the wrong... Now, honestly, is there like a quote-unquote wrong way to vote if you're given a choice? Like, could Donald Trump say in 2020, oh, sorry, California, you voted the wrong way. We can't count that. But I mean, you can't do that, right? Like a vote 
is a vote and you can't mess with that. Well, this directory says, yeah, France, you voted the wrong way and we actually can't count that. That sounds a, does that sound like democracy? Wow. But that's what the French Revolution was like supposed to be about, remember? That's like we were on the same page as the American Revolution, but it sounds like we got like from worse to worse to worse. And actually people are kind of done with all of this. And it says public opinion turned against them. It turned against them. And now people are saying, okay, um, I want to get back to normal because I was on board when we were protesting because of taxation without representation. I was on board. I was on board when we wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is like our explanation for revolution. I was on board when we like arrested the king. Heck, when we beheaded the king, like I didn't like violence, but I could get it. But at some point things got crazy and like we started closing down churches. Um, we started like banning chess. I, my kid's name is Constitution now for some reason. <laughs> like what was I? I'm pretty sure I turned in my neighbor and he was killed. Things kind of got out of hand. I wonder if there's a guy we could turn to that can like bring France back to normal. And there is. There's a general. A general that we all respect. A general who's a snappy dresser. Who's got a he's got a power pose. Yeah, he does like that thing with his knee, like a little it's like a little hand on the hip, a little, you know. Think about Napoleon. Think about Napoleon. He's a famous general. Everyone respects this guy. This is a guy who gets things done. And Napoleon, it says on the handout, Napoleon Bonaparte, he stages what's called a coup d'etat. That word, a coup, we'll write down, Napoleon takes over. A coup is a takeover. It's when someone overthrows the government. And that's what Napoleon does. He stages a coup. Napoleon takes over. And a lot of people are like, you know what? I'm okay with this because things have gotten kind of crazy. And maybe this general, maybe he's not like the nicest guy, but maybe he can like make it normal again. Let's, let's try Napoleon. I mean, at one point, we literally had a statue to the goddess of reason in my church where I got married, you know. At one point, it was illegal to play chess, you know. Maybe we'll try the Napoleon thing, right? And there are some things that he does that people think, okay, that's all right. In fact, on the next line, it says the consulate. You'll write down he ruled with three men. So there's a group of three guys, and they're like, hey, we're not trying to be a dictator. Dictators are bad. I'm not trying to be king. Kings are bad, right? He's... He's trying to do this. There are two things he do that does that people like. One, there's a law that he passes called the Concordat of 1801. And during the reign of terror, what did we close that people used to meet at and get married in and all that kind of stuff? Churches. And he's like, you know what? I, most people were like against that, but they didn't want to say they're against it because if you said you're against it, you might get thrown in jail. So in the Concordat of 1801, he, he supports the Catholic Church. He reopens the Catholic Church. Concordat of 1801. He reopens the Catholic Church. And a lot of people are like, okay, you know, that's good. You know, I was, I was uncomfortable when we closed the Catholic Church. And, you know, freedom of religion, that's good. And there's another thing he passes that people really like. He passes something called the Napoleonic Civil Code. And the basic gist of this is that there should be, you'll write down, equality under the law. And that means if I'm a rich guy, I should get treated the same as you if you are a poor guy. And a lot of people say, okay, you know, Napoleon, you're, you're kind of doing a good job. Like, things aren't crazy anymore. People aren't being, like, rounded up and arrested for playing chess. You know, like... I don't have to name my kid Constitution, yeah. <laughs> yeah, democracy, you know. Things are kind of like getting back to normal. But Napoleon thought, you know what, there's so much more I could do if I was just given the chance. As a result, 
it says on the handout, he crowned himself emperor. He crowned himself, not king, kings are bad, right? Not a king. Emperor. Different. <laughs> he crowned himself emperor. And when I say crowned himself, typically when a king becomes a king, who crowns a king? And yeah, the church, in fact, usually like a bishop or the pope. But look at this painting. This painting is by a famous painter named David. And here is Napoleon. He's holding a crown in his hand. He crowned himself already, but here kneeling in front of him is his wife, Josephine. And he's going to crown his wife, Empress. And you'll notice in the background are Catholic bishops, Catholic priests. They're doing nothing. So they're watching. But really, Napoleon doesn't need the church. He'll open the church. You can go to church, but he isn't getting crowned by God. He's crowning himself. He's now the emperor. Is this going the same direction as the American Revolution? I mean, how many years did George Washington serve? No. Washington served two terms, eight years total, and there was no rule. And, and people were like, dude, run for a third, you'll win easy. Heck, run for, run for life. You'll win every, everyone loves George Washington. And Washington said, listen, we didn't fight one King George just to have another King George. And he actually, King uh, George Washington chose not to run again even though he would have blown out anyone. Because he said, in America, we have to be different. We can't get obsessed with, oh, I'm a Washington for life guy. He says, we should be a democracy for life guy, and that means we need to change every several years. Washington, even though there was no rule, set an example, which is like actually a really cool example. Napoleon says, emperor for life, the American Revolution, French Revolution, we started off like on the same principles, but we like, Two very different turns. We're like executing people and like beheading people. You know, like it went, it got crazy quick. And you know what every good emperor has? You know, to be an emperor, you need to have a uh, empire. So he conquers everything in blue. And he either directly or indirectly. Like Spain, he puts his brother in charge. But everything in blue, he pretty much is in control. He, it says, created a vast empire. But if you notice on this map, there's one country that is super important he hasn't taken over. And in fact, it's the traditional rival of France. Who's that? Yeah. It, if you take a look, you know, here's Great Britain, right? That's his rival. Remember the British and the French? They always got beef with each other. And I mean, there's some practical reasons why he can't. They're an island. So that's, you know, there's some natural defense there. The British have a really great navy. And it really bums him out. He cannot take them over because he hates the British. It says enemy island. You'll write down Great Britain. Man, he hates the British. It'd be cool if I could take him over. Enemy island, Great Britain. They, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, there's the cell story of it. I mean, right there. And here, like, Napoleon's eyes are just like. like I feel like he wants to invade my heart, you know? And some people are like, I surrender, you know? Now, Napoleon conquers everything in blue. That would be really cool if I could take over Great Britain. And he tries, but it just doesn't, it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. And he says, okay, plan B. If I can't militarily crush them, it would be really cool if I could, like, economically crush them. So what he does is he tells all the countries in blue, you cannot buy and you cannot sell anything to Great Britain anymore. What's that going to do to their economy? Yeah. yeah. We'll write down the continental system. It was illegal to trade with Britain. The continental system. It was illegal to trade with them. 
He was hoping to crush them. But you know what? It doesn't work out. So, man, that sucks. I've, like, literally conquered pretty much all the good parts of Europe, except for Britain. I tried. It's not working. Okay, plan B. You know when there's someone you want to go to homecoming to prom with, and, like, that doesn't work out, and then you have that other person, and, like, you're not into them that much, but they're, like, okay. They're okay, right? That's plan B. Well, Napoleon looks at this map and says, I have a plan B, too. And his plan B is pretty big. Who's his plan B on this map of who I can conquer and invade? America. America's not on this map. Oh, what's this big country here? Russia? That's Russia. Says he, oh he says, he says, wouldn't it be cool if all of Russia was blue? I mean, that would be awesome. I'm going to do that. Now, before I do that, though, I'm kind of running out of money because, you know, these bullets don't buy themselves. <laughs> you know, these, these cannons require cash. And so he's like, okay, I want to do more, but I need money. What do I have in the old imperial closet that I'm not wearing anymore? I got Louisiana. Now, Louisiana's not like, like today, Louisiana's like, okay, it's like that little state. But Louisiana, like the Louisiana Purchase, it was like a fourth, a fifth of America, like a bunch of territory. And you know what? Most of it had like no French people. This was like empty of white French people. So Napoleon's like, I'm not using this anyway. So Napoleon calls up Thomas Jefferson, says, hey, Thomas Jefferson, how would you like to make a deal? I would like to sell you Louisiana. I need money for bullets. And you, of course, I mean, who wouldn't want to expand America, Manifest Destiny? Let's make a deal. Jefferson says yes, sends over the cash. We just doubled our country in the United States with one purchase. And now Napoleon's got money for bullets and cannons. The Louisiana Purchase is sold to the Americans. Ms. Lacombe? Mm -hmm. Yep, thanks. Bye. Rios, you're going. So what happens next, we sell, they sell Louisiana, and that's great. And now he's got money to turn on Russia. So it says on the handout, Russia, the Grand Army of 1812, he invades Russia. Now, Russia has always been backwards compared to the rest of the world. Russia's always been, like, not as advanced. Like, they had, like, pretty much like slavery, like hundreds, uh, hundreds of years after the rest of Europe got rid of it, like white slavery. And so no one thinks, oh, this is going to be hard. In fact, if you look at the map, this blue is areas of Russia. Napoleon takes over, and the Russians realize we're never going to beat this guy. So what we want to do is we'll just actually surrender. Goodbye. We'll actually surrender, and I'll tell you what. What we'll do is we'll burn, I'm going to burn my farm, and I'm going to burn my city, and this is where I live, I live here, I'm going to burn my farm, move it, and we'll back up, Napoleon follows me, I'm just going to burn these farms and burn these cities, and I'm just going to back up, in fact, that's all I do, is I burn my field, burn my farm, back up, back up, back up, back up, now why is this a good idea? Because you're going to be left with crap. Yeah, and if you have 600,000 people, you know what they need to do three times a day? They need to eat. And I don't know where you're finding that food, because every mile you get deeper in Russia is a mile farther from France you are. And I don't mean to brag, but there's something else Russia has that I know, France, you have never experienced anything like this before. We have a Russian winter. Like, it, it snows in France. You have not had a winter like a Russian winter. Like, we're used to it. We could deal with it. Napoleon, every mile you get further in my Russia is a mile farther away from your precious France. This invasion, which seemed like it was going to be great, turns out to be a disaster. He started off with 600,000, like over half a million men. He has to actually make a U-turn. He has to come back to France. He comes back, it says on the handout, with only 30,000. All the rest died. That's incompetence. 
That's terrible. That's the worst. Only 30,000 were left. That meant 570,000 died. So this is kind of like the end for Napoleon. Uh, he has to step down, and it's embarrassing. And in fact, they decide to punish him by putting him in prison on this island. There's this island right here. It's off the coast of Italy. It's called Elba. And we'll write down, he's put in a prison, an island prison. It's called Elba. And they kind of figure, you're just going to live there the rest of your life. You know, and like you'll die, troublemaker. This guy who like conquered all of Europe. But Napoleon breaks out of jail. He makes it back to France. <laughs> he makes it back to France. And listen, he becomes emperor a second time. Bye. It says on your handout, there's something called the 100 Days. He breaks out and gets a new army. That's ridiculous. He breaks out of jail, goes back to France, gets another army, he takes over again. He's emperor again. Um, okay. <laughs> the, Br the British got to take care of this, though. And so the British and the French, they're going to face off one last battle one last time. This is called the Battle of Waterloo. This is Napoleon versus the British Duke of Wellington. We'll write down this is Napoleon's final loss. His Waterloo is the defeat. And so there's an expression in English if I say that was that test in chemistry was was uh, was your Waterloo. That means it was like where you were defeated, <laughs> or you thought I'm going to do so great, and then like eh, I turns out I don't know anything about chemistry. Oh, I think I'm it was your Waterloo. It was your Waterloo. That was his final defeat. And then they finally decided, okay, uh, we got to do something with Napoleon because last time we put him in jail, he literally like broke away. So they put him into another island prison. You take a look, it's right here. <laughs> so like, France is here. They send him right here like, near Africa, like, what are you going to do? I mean, like, oh, I escaped to Angola, you know, like, <laughs> St. Helena, he sent to a second island prison. And with that, Napoleon's story is over. And with that, the roller coaster ride ends. And guess who gets put back in France with Napoleon gone? They put another king in charge. Oh, my God. So they just did all that for it was a kind of a roller coaster because we started off with no taxation without representation. I'm with you. We started off with, uh, you know, protesting injustice, which I was with you. We had Declaration of Rights of Man with you on that. And then things got crazy where we started arresting people because we just suspected them of being bad, killed people. We banned churches, we banned chess, we changed the calendar, we changed the clock, we got rid of Christ, we changed our names. We had a dictator, we conquered Europe. It seems like uh, all of that happened so quick. And at the end of the day, France has a king again. When we compare the American and the French Revolution, we start off with the exact same reasons. But at the end, very different. Next week, when we get back from spring break, we'll be writing an essay comparing the American and French revolutions. And we'll add a third revolution that we've not talked about, which we'll talk about when we return, the Haitian Revolution, which is what happens when black enslaved Africans say, if all men are created equal, then how does that, how does that play out for me? We'll study and see how that plays out for them next time.